Welcome to Revolution Against Evolution. I'm your host, Doug Sharp. Your co-host, Rich Gear here as well. And uh, we have a special guest tonight, and I'm really excited to have him. It's Doug's brother, Steve. I know, what's the, what's the title of the show, Doug? Well, we're going to be talking turkey tonight. Talking turkey, I love it. And uh, it's going to be talking a little bit about turkey hunting and uh, its relationship with uh, uh, you know, our experience with uh, God uh, uh, being in the outdoors. Uh, but also uh, a little bit about the management of uh, God's creation that uh, we were charged with in the beginning. And so uh, I, that uh, I see is uh, part of what Steve does as being uh, with the National Wild Turkey Federation uh, and, and the Department of Natural Resources in the state of Michigan. Right. He is uh, uh, the R3 coordinator for, for the National Wild Turkey Federation. And Steve, I guess I'm going to let you explain what that is. Yeah, what is an R3 coordinator? Uh, R3 coordinator. Well, I'm a hunter, hunter recruitment, retention, and reactivation coordinator. And they uh, kind of shortened it down to R3 so they can get it on my shirt. Perfect. It's, uh, <laughs> uh, it's kind of hard to get all them words on the, on the shirt there. but uh, And I do, I work for the National Wild Turkey Federation, but I work with a cooperative project with the Department of Natural Resources and a couple of foundations out there. Hal and Jean Glasson Foundation is uh, one of them that uh, uh, works through to help fund these positions here. And uh, part of what I do is I try to recruit more and more hunters. Um, and uh, the wild turkey is kind of my thing. Uh, we've, uh, I've been hunting wild turkeys and been interested in hunting wild turkeys since the 1970s or early 1970s. And, Actually, when I first started hunting, I, I went uh, eight years without drawing a turkey permit. And now, really, we had to, uh, uh, now we can just buy them over the counter. It's, is it just, they come back so much? Is that what it is? That's what it's had, come back. The, the return of the wild turkey is probably one of the greatest success stories that we've had in wildlife restoration efforts uh, throughout the uh, United States. And it's because of the, North American model of conservation, uh, the, uh, through hunting uh, dollars, uh, anytime there's a purchase of firearms, ammunition, and hunting equipment, there is a 7% uh, excise tax, 11% uh, excise tax on applied at the manufacturer's level on all that equipment. And that pays for conservation efforts and, and restoration efforts of, of different species. And you see that in 1934, when they started the, what they call the Pittman Robertson Funds, uh, that act that uh, took place during that time, the restoration uh, of all sorts of species. We've seen, you know, the wood duck come back from near extinction. Uh, we've seen white-tailed deer come back. Oh, yeah. Back. And there's a ton of them. We've seen a whole bunch of them on the way. <laughs> we them up my yard here yeah. <laughs> tonight, so yeah. And the wild turkey. You know, the wild turkey is probably the greatest success story and it, because of how rapid they did come back. Um, it's amazing because I, I remember growing up, yeah. I never saw a wild turkey. I always wanted to see mm -hmm. one. Yeah, never, never seen them, I never saw one. Um, and and you know? part of the reason was because at that time, uh, the habitat wasn't really good for them. Yeah, why don't you talk a little bit about that? Because I remember when I was growing up, uh, I saw lots of pheasant and quail. Yep. And I never saw a wild turkey. Now it's the, re the reverse is true. And re the reason for that is uh, when the logging era came into the United States, uh, the settlers came in and they kind of cut down pretty much all the habitat area, yeah. right down to ground level there. And you, I mean, it was very desolate. And uh, what happened at that time was they grew into grasslands. And grasslands uh -huh. was great for Wild tur for not for wild turkey, but grasslands was great for uh, pheasants and quail, ah. and uh, so th that's what they thrived on there. Well, as the uh, grasslands matured into early successional growth, you see uh, smaller saplings and things like that grow, uh, grow up. Well, they got uh, better habitat for rough grouse and for like woodcock and, and, and uh, songbirds and things like that mm -hmm. that live in these uh, smaller timbers. Right. And then as that timber grew up into mature forest and everything there, then it got better habitat for white-tailed deer and for the wild turkey. And uh, so it's kind of neat because uh, at the turn of the century, I mean, we had wild turkeys when the settlers 
landed here in Michigan. And then when they came into to, uh, Michigan, they logged off the whole area. Well, pretty much the wild turkey was extirpated from the... Uh, so what time are you talking about the 1880s maybe or something yeah, like that? Yeah, the 1880s 70s. and up to, 19, up to the turn of the century in the 1900s. Uh, the turkey was pretty much wiped out uh, okay. of the state of Michigan. They weren't extinct, but they were extirpated uh, to the point where, you know, they, they were very much endangered. Also, at that time, there was a lot of market hunting that was going on at that right. time where people, there was no laws, you know, so there was no rules or regulations on how many turkeys you could take. So people just went in there and, and would harvest as many as they want. What and, turkeys you mean? Well, they yeah, had wild okay. turkeys. And, the, and they were very well sought after because they're good eating. They're good eating. I yeah. mean, from the time that that, lay, that egg is laid, there's something out there trying to eat them, including me. <laughs> I'm, one of the, I'm one of the biggest predators out there because I love eating wild turkeys yeah. and there's a lot of great recipes out there for that. So, uh, but anyway, the wild turkey has really returned uh, very well. 1954 was when the first restoration efforts was started in the state of Michigan. And uh, as they started to restore those wild turkeys back, uh, they started off with pen reared birds, and it really what does that mean? Okay. pen reared and raised the oh, pen reared. I see, okay, they, they were raised from the pens, okay, yeah, mm -hmm. and and to grow up to certain levels, and then they would release them out okay. in the wild. Well, they really didn't have the instincts that they needed to survive away from predators. <coughs> oh, um, okay. I, I mean, when they're young and small, like this, and first hatched out, actually, when they're in the egg still. You got coons and possums and skunks uh, trying to eat the eggs. Yeah. Then you've got and snakes uh, trying to eat the eggs. And then uh, as they're hatched out, well, then you got owls, hawks, mm -hmm. fox, cats, dogs, and coyotes all trying to eat, you know, small poles. <laughs> and uh, then after they're two weeks old, then they can fly up into the trees and they can keep away from a lot of them ground predators. But then you got the hawks and the owls and the, and, and bobcats. How do, they ever, how do they ever survive in adulthood? How they survive, and that's why they they they, they lay usually nine nine eggs. And one know, makes it, and, and <laughs> you'll usually have four or five to six uh, make them in a in a standard uh, clutch of uh, yeah. of, of eggs there and stuff that makes it to adult, adulthood. Uh, and then you have you know coyotes and. And uh, things like that that will take down a turkey, a full-grown turkey, you know, sometimes too. So, uh, but uh, uh, that's a pretty good job, though, for a coyote to take a turkey down. Yes, yeah, you got their uh, work cut out for them. And yeah, actually, a fox would uh, leave them alone. Yeah, fox would, you know, they will chase them around. And it's the same way with coyotes. Coyotes will basically, because a wild turkey's eyesight is so keen, their eyesight is ten times greater than what ours is. Is it really? their hearing is eight times greater than what we can hear. And they can run 18 mile an hour and they can fly 55 mile an hour. Wow! And you, you didn't think that, you know, you, you, all you think about is a butterball, you know? <laughs> but exactly imagine a butterball right. flying across your windshield at 55 oh, mile an hour. Oh man, yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, it's something else. Uh, they, um, but they can fly very well. Um, you know, they, you know, I mean, how big do they get? I mean, I've seen 22, 24 pounders. Yeah, I mean, I mean, they get up to, you know, wild turkeys usually up to about 25 pounds. Is really? A, is, you know, when they get really big, that's a, that's a very large uh, wild turkey. You know, uh, domestic turkeys, they get much bigger than that, you know. It's yeah, like, they breed them. Well, they, they breed them, them they to them that. That's why they can't fly. Yeah. <laughs> you know? that's, oh, that's why I can't yeah. fly. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, there's uh, uh, several subspecies uh, of turkeys, or the species of turkeys in, in, in the yes, United there States. Yes, there is. There's, uh, there's uh, actually five in the United States. Uh, uh, they just reintroduced the Gould's wild turkey, which is the fifth subspecies that was uh, in the United States. Uh, they reintroduced those in the late 90s. Uh, and it was kind of neat because I was working for the National Wild Turkey Federation at the time. And I would talk, tell my volunteers or whatever, you know, I said, hey, I, I like uh, supporting a national organization because, you know, one day because of national projects, we were able to 
reintroduced the Gould's Wild Turkey into the United States. Right. And uh, now they have a huntable population there. They have a limited amount of drawings that they can hand out. But I was fortunate enough to, to actually get one. get one of those uh, tags. So and, you've got, yeah, because you've gotten all five, right? I've gotten all five in the United States. But I actually got a Gould's Wild Turkey one before I got my Arizona bird. Uh, I got that one in Mexico, down by Chihuahua, okay. Mexico right. there. But there's a six subspecies, too, that um, is the um, oscillated turkey. That's down in the Yucatan Peninsula. Okay. And they have, the, I mean, they don't gobble. They have a really funny drumming sound that they yeah. do. And they're very beautiful in feathers until you get to the head. Head is only a mother could love. Oh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> it is uh, flat out ugly. I mean, I thought a uh, uh, eastern wild turkey was pretty ugly. Yeah, in face, yeah exactly. The, but they yeah. are very, uh, but they are a gorgeous bird. Uh, are they yeah, trying yeah. to introduce those in the states too? No, yeah. they're uh, they, they kind of need the jungle type terrain yeah. and that that uh, that type of atmosphere and stuff of what they survive on down there. So they'll probably never, you know, never really introduce those to So if you get one of those, you gotta go to the Yucatan. Yeah, you gotta go to the Yucatan or Guatemala. Well, you say Michigan has really only one. one they only have right? one species there. That's the Eastern Wild Turkey. It's uh, pretty much most of the states east of the Mississippi is, um, uh, is the uh, uh, Eastern Wild Turkey. We do have the Florida or Osceola Turkey. Uh, that's only in Florida, so Ted, you might be interested in that. Yeah. Um, but they, um, uh, they're a, a sleeker bird. They got longer legs. They're darker feathers. Uh, they live in the swamps down there, and I think they have the long legs to keep away from the gators. Oh, I just say, yeah. But they are the uh, pythons. Uh, yeah. yeah. The pythons. They probably like the yeah. Too, but, uh, <laughs> they would probably uh, like those also. You know, and as I say, anything out there, you know, is trying to eat them. And including me. And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, turkeys have some uh, interesting anatomy. They have a beard. They have a the waddles. They have yep. the snood. Uh, uh, can you tell me what the what that's all about? Well, uh, let me finish up with a different species there, right. so everybody gets an idea. There we have the Merriam's turkey, which is in the uh, nor up in the mountain ranges, and then you have the Rio Grande turkey, which is down in Texas, Texas yeah. and down in Oklahoma, and also Hawaii. Uh, it's got real grands, uh, and then uh, uh, those are the different species that we have. Um, all 50 for, different states? Uh, all but for Alaska. We don't have wild turkeys in Alaska. The winters are too harsh there to, uh, for them to survive too well there. So no turkey could, could, could make it up there, huh? Really be tough, yeah. Okay. It'd be really tough for them. You know, and it's just like, I mean, we have turkeys in the UP of Michigan. Uh, in areas that they get nine feet of snow, but pretty much in order for them to survive, they have to be some type of artificially feeding program. Oh, I see. Okay. Help, them, help them survive to get down to the, you know, the, the food source oh, and yeah. stuff there. But anyway, they do have, have a, a, what they call a beard, the males. They have a, have a beard that's uh, actually as a modified type feather. It looks like a horse mane more than anything really? else. Yeah. It comes out of a chest, right out of the chest of the bird. Okay. And um, what's the purpose it, of that thing? It, who knows? Who knows? Okay. Know. This is this is something that God could tell us when we get there. Yeah. You know, I mean, <laughs> it, it, it is it is something. You know, uh, they they have and in the beard length it will get longer and longer until it gets to about ten and a half to eleven inches long, and then they start wearing it off because it's dragging on the ground. Oh, okay. And stuff. They also have another thing called a snood. There's a little thing that dangles down yeah, over his shoulder. Yeah, what the heck is that on? Hello? I know. Yeah. <laughs> women back in the 40s, World War II, they had something called a snood. It yeah. Was basic, it looked like a floppy thing. Yep. They would hold their hair in or something. It was called a snood. Yeah, it is. But that's the that's model after the turkey, you know? Yeah. And then they got this little thing hanging down there. I get this every once in a while. Yeah. It's called a dewlap. You know, it kind of hangs down there, but then they have the waddles that's below their neck, and it's just, uh, and, and these waddles, as they're, depending on their mood, if they're scared or, or something scares them, whatever, they turn really white. Oh. But as they get excited, if they see another bird, another turkey in there, and, they, and they're very social birds, uh, they will, that will turn a beet red. 
Okay. Uh, in a matter of seconds, you can see actually change. Really? Yeah, you wow. can see a change, you know, and stuff, depending on their mood. And uh, there was times I was hunting turkeys, uh, and I'd seen a turkey out there, and he had a white, his waddles were white and stuff, and wasn't paying any attention to hen calls or anything like that, and then I turned around and I did a gobble, and he says, oh, I'm going to stand for that. And he turned around, <laughs> and his waddles just turned breed red. Really? He's wow. Come over, come over and... Yeah. Kick some tail feathers and take some names, you know. Yeah, and the, <laughs> yeah they got spurs and uh, got some spurs on their legs. And the, just the males, just like a uh, chicken or whatever would have a, uh, you know. The, does that, does that they, help them defend themselves? Yeah, they fight. That's what they use for fighting, and they can get up to two inches long. You know, some of them. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you get a os uh, oscillated. Down in the Yucatan Peninsula, those are the ones that get up to two and a quarter inches long, yeah. and they're sharp as needles. Oh, they're very really sharp, you know, but they use them for fighting. I mean, that's what, that's what they use them for. And Do so they fend off like foxes or coyotes or anything? Oh, yeah. They'll, they'll uh, defend okay. themselves with that, you know. And hen, hens will not have a spur, um, so they have to, have to depend mm -hmm. on the gobblers to try to keep things on away. the spur of the moment, right? On the spur of the moment. Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> wow. So tell us a little bit about the techniques of turkey uh, hunting itself. Uh, you've got you brought some calls in here. and. Uh, yeah. And uh, I've gone out with, with you now. You, you're uh, um, uh, recruiting uh, people like me who've never hunted before uh, to uh, go out turkey hunting for the very first time. You've been very and, successful this and, year. Uh, and I've, yeah, yeah. Um, I've, I said, well, I've got to figure out what uh, Steve's so interested in. And so I've, uh, for the past few uh, years after I retired, I decided to go out hunting f with them for the very first time. Now I haven't quite uh, shot one yet. I've gotten two shots at, at birds, but uh, um, and that's there is a little story behind that too. <laughs> oh well, let's hear that story. I'm kind of excited about yeah, this. Yeah, well, he was what's the story? <laughs> well, it was probably my fault more than anything else there because oh. uh, I uh, harvested bird earlier in the season. And uh, I hauled that shotgun around from, you know, down in Kentucky and bounced it up and down bouncing mountains yep. or whatever. Yep. Well, I, you know, and then I handed the gun over to to, to uh, Doug there, and and uh, he was, you know, called in a nice turkey for him, and he comes walking right in there, and oh, this is perfect, you know, kaboom! Oh, it uh, it just. Uh, uh, shot right over the top of them. I go, well, oh, I don't know what happened there, you know. And uh, so later on this spring, this is after it was all over. I went out and boom, and I shot over this turkey. Is the sights wrong? I missed it, and I looked at it, and the, the scope was going like this, rattling <laughs> on there. So it wasn't Doug's fault. <laughs> okay, Doug, you're off the hook. Yeah. Anyway. So maybe turkey hunting's beyond my scope, right? Yeah. yeah. But yeah. anyway, that was a, you know patting your shotguns before you go out there. There's kind of a moral story there. But uh, anyway, hunting wild turkeys is very, really cool. Spring of the year has become extremely popular for turkey hunters. Uh, and uh, to get out there when the world is just coming to life, and it's absolutely beautiful, you know, and you get out there before and, and listening to the woods wake up in the morning mm -hmm. and hearing God's creation come to life in the spring of the year, there's nothing like it. It's absolutely wonderful sounds, you know, you hear the hear songbirds going on and singing, you'll hear a whippoorwill, you know, before it gets daylight, whippoorwill will be singing and stuff like that, and you'll hear a <coughs> The barred owl sounds off there, and then a <coughs> bird turkey will gobble to it, <laughs> you know, and to hear that, that start off with them bird sounds in the spring of the year, it's just absolutely wonderful. Now we're entering into the fall, and a lot of people kind of miss the boat when it comes to fall turkey hunting. And so I'm going to talk a little bit so about So are there two hunting. seasons in a turkey hunting? Two seasons, okay. yeah. There's one in the spring, okay. uh, and that is for tom turkeys only. You can only shoot a gobbler in the spring of the year. But in the fall is a management tool to either reduce populations or maintain populations at a certain level. And it's also a tool that 
landowners can use to reduce the populations, allow X amount of hunters to come in there. And they do have some public land hunting there. So uh, in the spring of the year, you know, you, you, you try to imitate a hen with a hen yelp. And And that is a mating call of a hen. You know, really? I mean, when she's, you know, and of course, the old gobbler is going to be out there and going, oh! he likes that time of year. You know, yeah, of so, course, yeah. And that's what he, the reason that they do gobble is they're trying to attract hens and bring them back and forth yeah. to you there. And uh, so you you make the hen sounds and, and uh, you know, if things don't work too well, then you can kind of go, well, things are pretty nice over here and you can do some contentment calls. Like the acorns taste real good and the bugs taste good over here. Of course the old gobbler will gobble to that, you know, and stuff like that. So you have a lot of a lot of great uh great, That's a great cool little tool. Out. What is that? Yeah, it's a slate call. The Native Americans uh used to make them out of a piece of slate and they would mount it in a turtle shell okay. and then they would use a deer antler to, for the striker and they wow. would That's amazing. make the sound of the wild turkey you know and stuff but uh, you do things a little bit differently in the fall because uh, they're a social bird they like to be together but the gobblers are going to be in bachelor groups in the fall and the hens and poles are going to be in other groups so if you are in an area and that's where scouting comes in play knowing what kind of birds are in the area you look for the types mm -hmm. of feathers okay. black tip feathers are going to be a gobbler brown tip feathers is going to be a hen you know so if you got a bunch of brown tip feathers hanging around which they're molting in the fall they're losing a lot of their feathers and re regrowing them uh, then they will come back uh, but you can uh, hunt both of them in the fall you can hunt them both in the okay. fall and believe me those hens fit in a turkey pot really well. <laughs> <laughs> some really good eating right there. Oh, you know, man. And, uh, nice and tender and stuff, so don't uh, don't overlook it. And a lot of people, you know, okay, what kind of techniques do you want to do? Well, if you're hunting gobblers, you want to sound like a gobbler. And so there's a couple things you can do. Uh, I have a little 35 millimeter film can. Yeah, I used to have them a long time ago, drill yep. holes in the bottom. Cut a slit in the top, put a little rubber latex glove over the top of it, and sound like a gobbler. You can sound like a gobbler out in the woods there and stuff. Or what you can do is do some slow, raspy yelps. And that's a gobbler yelp. How do you know which one to do? If you get done your scouting and you got a lot of black tip feathers in the area you're hunting, those are gobblers in that area, so you want to sound like a gobbler. How about that that one or that one? Well, both of them. Okay. You can use them in, 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 okay. uh, uh, with each other and stuff like that. But if you're ha hunting hens and poles and young birds, you want to sound like a young bird, and so you can do a little kiki. And then throw in a, you know, that's a young, young bird out there, and then throw in a old hen assembly yelp where she's going to try to get her brood back together. <laughs> There's some cutting right there. You can do cutting in the spring also, but. Uh, that's some things that you can do there. Um, you were telling me one time when I was out with you and they were going down the two track there, you said if you see a, a, a bunch of turkeys out in the middle of the road, get out of the car, go bow, 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 <laughs> That's and right. scare them all off. Scare them all off and then you try to call them back in. And what you can do is, the, this is a diaphragm call, and then you put it in the roof of your mouth and uh, you can do key keys with that. That's what the young bird sounds like. So 
So it's a it's a great call. And what are those, what's that made out of? <laughs> Take it out of your mouth. Yep. It's a little latex and a, uh, uh, that's just passed between the tongue and the reed. Another great call right there, but uh, the fall is another great time of year mm -hmm. to get out there. You know, the uh, things are coming to life, you know, in the spring of the year. Right. Things are hunkering down, hunkering down in the fall of the year, yeah. but it's still a great time of year to be out in the woods oh, the because colors. God's creation is so beautiful. The colors are starting to turn and yeah. the cool, crisp mornings, cool, crisp mornings you get out there and the and, and uh, the frost is on the leaves and it starts to warm up during the day and the water dripping off. So what time do you usually like go out in the fall? Is it from September or September October? 15th is when it starts in the fall and it goes to November 14th just before yeah, two months. Fire, firearm deer season. So, okay, all right. Yeah, but it's a great time to be out in the woods. It's so much fun and uh, uh, just to be out there in God's creation just and, and, and recognize it. And you need uh, everybody needs to get in full camouflage like this right here oh yeah put a face mask on see he's so he's, he's 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 yeah. proper he's got the mask on yeah. yeah get out there with with the mask on and sit very still which you probably have a hard time doing i would have a hard time doing sit that. very still for about a half hour and watch what comes to life you know you can have a little black cake chickadee land on your gun barrel fly away and then fly up there, land on the on the bar on your tree stand, and yep. then fly away. Then I had to come back and land on the bill of my hat. Come around, and looked at me like this right there. Oh my God! And I tell you what, folks, that is a gift from God when that happens. It is. It is wow! Uh, it is absolutely something that you really owe yourself. You know, time to get out in the woods just to be able to, you know, be a part of that. It well, was just a really good time. You know, uh, this is the National Wild Turkey Federation. You can uh, learn a, bit, a little bit more about this at uh, nwtf.org. Yep. And um, uh, Steve is uh, um, uh, available. He's uh, you know, part of the National Wild Turkey Federation. And um, you can uh, find out more about the National Wild Turkey Federation. And uh, I'm going to... Uh, probably do a little second show with him right now because uh, uh, he has many turkey stories to tell. So say, stay tuned. We'll see you next time on Revolution Against Evolution. Bye now.